Hello and welcome to the first session uh, after lunch break. Uh, gentle reminder, please uh, turn off your phones. You don't want to hear any, any nice ringtones going off. Uh, with this, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, uh, Erwin Goslavsky. Uh, Erwin has an academic background in computer science and business administration from RWTH Aachen. But he has been interested in uh, computer science and especially in uh, diverse hacking topics from his youth. And he has uh, also been a member of international cybersecurity uh, challenges. Uh, currently, he is working as a software consultant for TNG and especially working in the area of cloud based web applications. But today, the talk is more into the, the direction of hacking, I would say. It's yes. about uh, domain sniping. Um, Erwin was so kind to allow questions uh, to his talk during the talk. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and he will try to address them immediately. But also after the talk, there will be time for questions. And especially for the um, people that are joining us uh, uh, remotely, please write your questions into the Slack channel and we will also um, ask them to the speaker after the talk. Uh, with this, I'm happy to give the microphone to Erwin and uh, have fun with the talk. Yes. Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for the nice introduction. So let's start. This you already know. I'm catching single character domains for around seven years now. But let's start with this number, 354 million domains. That's the most recent, most accurate number of registered domain names you can find. And may I ask who of you in the audience has their own domain name? Quite a lot. All right, what are you using your domains for? Is it personal use, business use, websites, emails, everything? Anybody selling or buying domains? So any traders here? Anybody interested to become a trader? <laughs> Who wants to buy a single character domain today? <laughs> I will make you a very special offer at the end of this talk. All right, but what is domain sniping? When you go to Wikipedia, I also asked ChatGPT about the Wikipedia answer. Uh, I considered a little bit uh, better, so this is why we still go with um, a more traditional definition. And when you go to Wikipedia, first thing you will notice that you will be redirected to a page called Domain Drop Catching, because well, domain sniping is more of a yeah, nice catchy name, but the more formal term is Domain Drop Catching. And they say on Wikipedia, domain drop catching, also known as domain sniping, is the practice of registering a domain name once registration has lapsed, immediately after expiry. So there are a couple of terms we will have to cover on the next slide. First one, what is a domain? Next, how do you register a domain? So what are the different kinds of systems behind domain name registration? And then, very important, what is the expiry? So when does the domain become available again? So those three terms are quite generic and not really well specific to my talk. What's interesting at the end is this little word immediately, and this is where the domain sniping begins. But first about domain names. So another question for you. What is the first domain name you remember? Go back to your childhood. Maybe you were at school like I was when I visited my first website. So what's the first name you will remember? So I hear a lot of Google, Yahoo, GMX. Alter is oh. <laughs> So for me personally, it's also Google, which was registered in 1997. But actually, there are many years with many more, or at least some domains before that. So does anybody know what the first .com domain registered ever was? Any ideas? Symbolics.com. Even 12 years uh, before Google, this was the first .com domain. And yeah, today 
we are at around 160 million .com domains alone. All right, but why do we even have, a domain, uh, have domain names? Well, they are human readable, so they are made for us, and they are memorizable. But how does the domain name system work? So how is the domain built up? And for this, I will start again with google.com as an example. And actually, google.com is a so-called subdomain. So google.com is a subdomain of the .com domain. And you can imagine the, uh, imagine the whole domain name system as a big tree. And here we have, oh, this is fancy. Here we have the uh, com top level domain, and below it's the subdomain, which is Google. Top level domain, there are many more. There's com, org, net, and today more than 1,000 different uh, top level domains. And above all those top level domains, there's a so called root, which is the null label. And if you then combine all those um, boxes along uh, a line in the tree with full stops so or with dots, then you get the so called uh, fully qualified domain name. So to get the fully qualified domain name of google.com, you would simply add another full stop at the end. So this will become interesting again at the end of this talk. All right, so much for the domain name system. And of course, uh, you can have um, subdomains uh, all the way down. For example, mail.google.com, you have other com domains like tngtech.com, org domains, and as mentioned, other top level domains. All right, but what kind of top level domains exist? First off, there are the generic ones. This one's like com, org, net, and so on. Although they have like an intended purpose, so for example, a com domain for commercial purposes, you can register and use them as you like. On the other hand, there are generic restricted GRTLDs. Those are bis, name, and pro. So there also you can register any domain you like. If you don't use it for the specified purpose, someone else can come along and finger point at you and say, hey, this guy is using the domain for an unintended purpose, and then you can lose your domain. Next, uh, so-called sponsored or STLDs. For example, very popular in the United States for education, government and military. So those domains are not available to everybody. So you have to be active in the specified industry. Next, more recently, are the new generic top-level domains. It starts at AAA currently, which is the American Automobile Associ Association. It goes over technology, and currently it's ending at uh, Zurich. So you have uh, TLDs for every topic, for cities, for organizations, like Google has their own top-level domain. I don't know, they use it for a couple of domains, but apparently it's fancy, and if you are a big player, you need your own domain nowadays. And interesting for this call, uh, talk are the country code top-level domains, CCTLDs, because those are the shortest ones. They are uh, made of only two characters, for example, US for the United States, DE for Germany. And interestingly, there are also uh, domains like e uh, EU, which are not for a single country, but for a geographical region. Now, there are also so-called internationalized TLDs, which is also a rather recent development. There you have uh, the Greek EU domain, because why not? And more interestingly, you have also, of course, other languages, um, other alphabets in the world. Then this is the Emirate domain of the United uh, Emirates. And as you maybe know, they write uh, the other direction, so domains are also built the other direction compared to ours. But uh, top-level domains also come and go, so nothing is written in stone. Does anybody has an idea what CSS uh, top-level domain stands for? It's one of the newest countries in the world. Right. So whenever a new country is like accepted by the international community, they will also get their own uh, codes for everything and also their own uh, top-level domain. And who knows this old domain, DD? 
Exactly, Eastern Germany. So this one does not exist anymore. But yeah, it had, it had its life. <laughs> Next one, SU, Soviet Union. Interestingly, the Soviet Union domain, I can hardly see the pointer from here. This one is still in use. So also there's a RU domain for Russia, because Russia is uh, like a successor of the Soviet Union. They got the rights of the SU domain, and they just continue using it. So this can also happen. And as I said, there are many like companies who decide to register their own uh, top-level domains for the brands, for example. Those four ones, Fiat, Maserati, Cooking Channel, and Food Network, those have been recently deleted. So companies register them, pay like 100,000 for the initial registration and so on, and then they discover, oh, well, we don't use them anyway, so let's get rid of those. And currently, at least uh, yesterday, there were 1,470 TLDs uh, delegated in the root zone. So those are the domains you can generally resolve when you open your browser, for example. All right, so how do you register a domain? I will do another example of the .com domain because this is also different for every top-level domain. So here are you, here's the .com domain, and this you want to have. So first thing, there's someone who has to manage all .com domains, right? Because otherwise, I would say hey, Google.com is my domain, but of course, this uh, can't work. So there's a so-called registry, and in the example of .com, there's a company in the United States called Verisign. So they are managing the .com domain space, and if you want to get a domain, they will keep track of it. However, they don't like uh, work with you directly, so you can't go just to Verisign and tell them, hey, I want the .com domain. But instead, it was decided that there must be or should be another level in between. So there are so-called registrars. There are currently uh, around 2,500 of them, which are directly working with the Verisign registry. And you can go to uh, such a registrar, for example, Gandhi is uh, one example, and they will do the registration in your name. So you go to the registrar, tell them I want this con domain. They say, OK, we'll go to Verisign. They say, OK, it's free. And then you get it. And what also can happen, that there are an optional reseller in between. Let's say you have a rather small company where you provide like web hosting, and you also want to offer your customers um, domain name registration, but you are not big enough, so it's worth to become a real registrar, then you can also be a reseller working with an existing registrar. All right, so when we talk about domains, there are rules. There are a lot of rules, and we will cover all of them. So we'll start with the general rules. <laughs> Then there are top-level domain-specific rules. So general rules are like technical hard limits. You, you can't get along those. But each top-level domain can choose their own specific rules where they say, hey, we don't want this name or whatever. We want uh, to have a minimum length, which is more. We don't want to allow emojis and so on. And there are also domain-specific rules. So I will show you a few example domains, and you will tell me if those domains may be registered or not. We'll start with the domain length, and we have a domain consisting of more than 100 A's in a row .com. And may I register that domain or not? Who says yes? You are wrong. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> There is a limit of, uh, on each of those labels, so labels are the parts between the dots, and those may be a maximum of 63 characters, so this is more than 63, not allowed. Next example, allowed characters, this is smiley.com. No. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, there are other smileys.com which have been registered in the past, so it changes all the time. Reserved words, www.it, yes or no? Oh, you got the pattern right. <laughs> okay, you can't register that one. So next there are rules on the registrant, trend, which would be me. And some uh, top-level domains have rules regarding the presence. 
So, can I register best cheesecake at dot NYC? No, <laughs> because I am not a resident of New York City. <laughs> and NYC says, hey, this is our domain for our people, for our companies. That's the way it goes. And as I mentioned earlier, there are those uh, sponsored TLDs. <laughs> And yeah, I guess you know the answer. I, I don't get this domain either. All right, then there are, yeah, now we are coming to the domain specific rules. For example, there are premium domains where the registry says, oh, this is a nice name. Why don't we make a lot of money out of it? And there are a lot of usage rules. So it could be, for example, server location. There are top level domains to say, okay, you can have a domain, but you have to host your content in our country. It's fair. There are legal reasons, so you can't put uh, everything you want on your domain. And you have to consider the laws of the country of the top level domain. We will see an uh, Islamic example later on. So be careful when you choose your top-level domain, depending on what content you want to host. And regarding content, let's continue with a nice example, in my opinion, which is the cat domain. Who knows what cat stands for? Fast before you read it. OK. <laughs> it's Catalonia. And they have their own domain. And they say, well, if you have a website, it must have a significant amount of contents in Catalan. And they are serious about it. So it's uh, not like f uh, funny only cat content. You, you, you have also have, uh, Catalan content. <laughs> OK, let's have another look at an example, which is .aq. What does AQ stand for? Any ideas? Sorry? Yes, exactly, Antarctica. So, do you think there are a lot of domains there? Ah, oh, Zoom, I don't hear them. OK, yeah. So the answer was Antarctica, and this is right. So .aq is a top-level domain for Antarctica. And if you want to register a .aq domain, when you are lucky, you find this uh, text file somewhere, or you find someone who can send it to you. And those are all the rules. And we'll take a little closer look at some of those. So first, they say the .aq cctld is a closed, moderated uh, TLD. So someone else is deciding if you get a domain or not. So it's not free like .com, first come, first served. And they say .aq domains are available to government organizations who are signatories to the Antarctic Treaty, but also to others who have a physical presence in Antarctica. Isn't that nice? But at least they are so kind to also consider a physical presence to include unattended installations and also short-term visits. So if you make holiday there, you might get a domain. And even nicer, domains are free. I mean, you hardly get a free uh, domain under a top-level domain, so this is a really good chance. Unfortunately, you only get a single one, so if you want to trade domains, this might not be uh, the top-level domain to look for. And if you want to register a domain, you have to complete this template. This is the bottom half here, and just send it for your email. Then someone will help you. All right. Uh, rules uh, change over time. For example, length, if you remember, in the early days, you had the minimum length on um, .de domains, which was three characters, and then some two-character German car manufacturer decided to uh, use some legal measures to get the preferred domain. And since then, rules uh, have been changed so that also single and two-character domains under .de are available. There are internationalized domain names. These also include the uh, umlauts, so R, Ö, and so on, but also other accented characters, which in general have not been possible initially, but later have been made available. Prices change all the time. I don't have to tell you that. The premium names, so sometimes uh, like single characters are initially treated like all other domains, so they get the standard cheap rate. But yeah, sometimes the registry thinks, well, 
those might be worth something, so we want to get some money so that no one gets them uh, cheaply and sells them expensively. Also restricted names um, also change, so sometimes domains become restricted uh, later on or they become free again, so it's changing all the time everywhere. Also subdomains, if you remember, in initially you could not get a .uk domain, for example, so it was always .co.uk and so on. And a few years ago, they also decided to open this one up, so now you can also get uh, .uk domains. Next, there uh, are also registrar-specific rules. Sometimes they have a stricter length, maybe because they just uh, don't keep up with all those rules change of the registry, so they know, oh, it's been always a minimum four characters, and they simply didn't get the message that you now can register an even shorter domain. And of course, they also have their own prizes. All right, now we have talked a lot about rules, and next one from our initial quote will be expiry. So in general, there's a rule, this upfront payment, so no money equals no domain. And what are the reasons for a domain and to expire? Well, typically, it's an intended one, so you don't use it anymore, you let it expire. Others are, uh, well, you miss the renewal notification, like I did, for example, which is kind of sad because you uh, lose your domain name and someone else can grab it, which is also what I do. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Another reason, death of an owner, companies going uh, bankrupt and so on. So nobody will, it's, it's like it's your job in the end to uh, renew your domain, so remember that. If anything you remember from your talk, uh, take care of your domains because it's your responsibility to renew those. Some examples, hotmail.co.uk, Microsoft lost that one. They missed all the renewal notifications, no idea how, and they were lucky. So someone else registered it and said, hey, Microsoft, is that your domain? They said, oh, cool, yeah. But uh, yeah, so they got it back. They, they were quite lucky. And another example, foursquare.com, they almost lost, lost their domain. But like in the last few days, they still managed to get it. And for each top-level domain, there are specific expiration uh, schedules and phases. All right, so much about that. Now let's dive into short domains. I have a list of public sales numbers about, uh, of short domains. So not all sales are public, but at least some are. And now you may do some estimations. We will start with fb.com. I hope everybody knows who bought this short domain. Any estimates? How many? <laughs> but yes, you're right. <laughs> Single digit millions, yes. Eight and a half million they paid for that one. Next one I have is Z.com. It is now a trading platform. Any estimates for that one? Anybody offering more? 100K? A bit more, almost 7 million. Yeah, and now we are coming to like my, my playground, the single character domains of a country code, top level domain. And the highest sell I found was O.co. Any estimates for that one? Millions, I hear millions. Billions, no? <laughs> well, unfortunately, just a couple of hundred thousand. So they are not quite as valuable as the short com domains. There are also other domain sales I found. So more recently, f.cr, which is like more the normal price level of uh, single character domains, which are well not really popular. Uh, this individual one. And other example, d.ki, which was quite cheap last year, and k.lg, which was quite cheap a few years ago. Anybody has an idea why single character domains are sometimes so cheap, sometimes so expensive? Yeah. 
Yeah, so if it makes up a company name, so there's someone really interested in the domain, so they are willing to pay more. Another thing is the top-level domain itself has the rules, has the prices, and for example, the .ki domain, which we see here, it's expensive. Like each .ki domain costs you more than $1,000 a year. So why, why, why pay thousands for a domain which you pay thousands anyway just to have it? And for k.ag, maybe it was just not the right time 16 years ago. At least more recent sales are also four to five figures uh, for .ag domains. Next are big companies. So another guessing game for you. Who is the owner of a.co? Amazon are here, right? Gco, Google, Gco, you know it. Twitter. TME, maybe? Yes, right. Now we have VME. Vimeo, nope. Nope, not we contacted. It's Visa. And I also found a more local example, which is S.de. Who knows it? SAP, no? Did you know they have uh, SZ? Sparkers, uh, correct. Yeah, so sometimes they have domains, but sometimes, well, you don't know them because they, they have them, but they don't use them. Because why not? <laughs> All right, uh, short domains are nice for name hacks. So you can have words like c.at for cat, currently available for an auction. I think the minimum offer is 60,000 euros. So if you're interested, the ET, Ethiopian domain, is quite nice for a lot of English words. Then you can have names like Kim, and also companies and organizations. For example, NPR, it's the National Public Radio in the United States, or our local car manufacturer here. All right, let's talk a bit about the availability of such domains. And as I said, the rules changed, so initially, Singlecharacter.com domains were all available. This was the time when those three have been registered. But then in December, all remaining ones have been simply reserved. So you can't get them anywhere anymore. But the existing ones have been grandfathered. So if you had uh, one of those registered, they are still valid. So you can keep them. And when we look at uh, country code TLDs, Around 125 allow or allowed single character domains at some point in time. Now, what are my options now if I want to get a single character domain? Of course, I can always use a longer top level domain, for example, .cars. Yeah, you can buy existing ones, so those are sales numbers from last year I found, so around 1,000 to 20,000 per domain. You can register premium domains, for example, the vanuatu.vu. They want 3,500 per year for a domain. Well, too expensive. .ki, I already explained, so this is generally an expensive top-level domain. You can register an accented character, for example, this R with a circle above it. But actually, internally, this is uh, converted to the Punicode domain, it's called. So this is like the domain which is really behind this one. And similar, you can also register <coughs> register emoji domains, for example, it's this FM domain, but same as the one above, it's also encoded differently. If you are lucky and you have a trademark, like some company I will tell you shortly about, has, and someone else has a domain which matches your trademark, they could use the so-called Unifor do Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy, which is an arbitration way to settle uh, domain disputes out of court. This is how this uh, car manufacturer got the domain. And of course, there's always uh, illegal options. So this illegal extortion could be cheap, could be expensive. You always need a bit of luck. If you are unlucky, then you might get 20 years in federal prison, like this guy in the United States said, after attempting to extort an internet domain name in an armed home invasion. So. It's like a bit of sad, but yeah, it's something valuable and like jewelry, money, gold bars, so someone will come to your home and try everything to get uh, your valuables. 
But we are in the legal domain here, so let's talk about drop catching where you need time, luck, and a bit of money. So this brings us to our last point from the initial Wikipedia quote, which is the point immediately, and there's where the drop catching fund starts. For this, we have to see a bit how the domain lifecycle works, and I will start with example of a .com domain. You start with the registration, and let's say I register a .com domain today. Typically, it's valid for one year, so you have creation date today, expiry date July 7 next year. And typically, sometime next year, I will renew it, and then the expiry date will just move one year in the future. At some point, when I stop renewing it, there could be a so-called auto-renew grace period, which is zero to 45 days, so it depends on your registrar. But this is now leading to the domain status renew period, so at this point, you should really try to renew your domain, because some uh, registrars already try uh, start to auction them off. So they say, hey, we got this domain, it's still registered, but it should be free shortly, so if you're interested, you can pay us a lot of money, why don't you come to our platform, bid on it, and it might be yours in a few days. Afterwards, there's the redemption grace period. This is your really final chance to get your domain. You have to pay extra in this period. Also, domain uh, has a known domain status. Yes? It's done by the register where the domain is registered. Okay, the question was if this domain auctioning is done by the um, registrar where the domain is currently registered, and the answer is yes. So you should maybe also take a look at your registrar, what kind of business they really are in. So are they selling domains to you, or are they auctioning off the domains they already have? So, and after this redemption grace period, time is over, there's a deletion period, five days, but you can't do anything in this period. Afterwards, the domain is deleted and becomes available again. So, in general, with this information, the drop date is known as basically public information about the domain. And some uh, top-level domains even have official drop lists. For example, the .tt, Trinidad and Tobago, they have a website and they say, oh, we know people are interested in single character domains, so why don't we show them all of them and when they expire? The exact time, however, this varies. So generally, you have an idea like a time frame around two hours per day where domains typically drop, but this is also very depending on the top level domain. And this brings us to drop catching. It's a very huge business for common top level domains. So 75% of all .com registrars are just doing do drop catching. It's, it's a million dollar business. And like I mentioned, they do auctions, so they get most, uh, as much money out of it as possible. And they are really, really fast. So it's, we are in the milliseconds range uh, after the domain drop. All right, let's say you want to do it yourself. So preparation step, you have to find the top level domains which are suitable, you have to find the registrar which is suitable, and you have to determine the life cycle. So when does the domain drop, on which date, and if possible, at which time. Then you would monitor your domain, so you find the drop candidates, the domains which will drop at a certain date. And then there's a drop catching, so you have to implement, test, and execute a fast registration method. So for the research, if you want to find the short TLDs, it's simple. There's a list of all 1,470 top-level domains. It's a simple text file you can download. You all, uh, also see again the ones I mentioned earlier, AAA, Zurich down here, and highlighted uh, country code top-level domains. There are 248 of those, and then you would see, well, where is an existing um, short domain already registered? For this, you can use uh, DNS queries. So it's simply use a tool like DIG, uh, which allows you to find out uh, the na name server records of a domain. And then you would see, oh, a.gl has an A record with this IP address. So you know, okay, this domain exists. It's a very good indicator 
to find uh, suitable top-level domains. So I did this recently, and I found exactly 125 country code top-level domains where there are already single character domains registered. All right, next point, you have to find suitable registrars. There exists also like public lists, for example, with tldlist.com here. And you say, hey, I want to register a .gl domain. Tell me who, uh, which registrars are offering that one. And then you already get a list, you get the prices, and then you can pick the registrar you want to use. Let's say I am now interested in the registrar Gandhi. And then I go to Gandhi and see, oh, what are the terms and conditions of GL domains? And luckily, they are available to everyone. And they already say, hey, minimum length is one character. So perfect. Next, you will determine the life cycle. There's, on the one hand, registrar information. So they like, collect the information of all the registries, which is like nice because it's all in one place. It's in your language. But it could be outdated, incorrect, whatever. So like the source of proof would be the registry. And for example, at .gl, the registry tells you all the redemption periods, the grace periods, and also the limits. All right, then you will go to monitoring. And I have a lot of more time. Perfect. So you find the possible drop dates. For this, you need to find out when the domain expires. There's the so-called WHOIS protocol. It's a standard protocol about public uh, domain information, about registered domains. And also, there's, of course, a Linux tool, which uh, helps you create those. And when you do it on example.com, it tells you, hey, then it was created, updated date, and on this date, it expires, unless it's renewed, of course. But the amount of information varies heavily. For example, if you go to the DENIC, the DE domains, they don't publish this information. They don't tell you when a domain will, uh, was registered or when it will expire. Also, there are a lot of different formats. So for example, the Mexican domain uh, registry uses a different date format. There's so-called web who is. For example, Spain, if you create a Spanish domain, they will tell you, hey, you can look up the online. And why they do this? Uh, because online, it's easier to protect the information. So for example, then they say, hey, you can get the information, but please fill out this capture, uh, select the cars in these pictures, and so on. You know it. But then you also get the information, but now on a nice website. And know who is? Anybody has an idea which top-level domain, which we already saw earlier, does not give you any OS information? Dot .mil, I hear. Anything else? Dot .eu. It was also a country code. Antarctica, I hear. Yes, exactly. At least they tell you that this domain or this DLD has no OS server. Well, so you have to somehow find your information sources and aggregate those. And then you have to check regularly. Ideally, you would automate it and consider the rate limit. So like the Swiss information is often rate limited. So take care of this. And also, if you're a developer, you should think about rate limiting your public endpoints. All right. When it comes to drop catching, you have to have a lot of patience. But every once in a while, every few months, there is a drop candidate. and. Hopefully, you know the date and time window. Then you do your final preparation and checks. You have an account. You have the payment method, very important. You have tested everything you want to do. And then comes the drop date. And this brings me to a few examples I have prepared. So Greenland, you know, it's this big blob of ice here at the top. And some years ago, I was monitoring an old so-called migrated domain name. What, did they, what they said is, well, they introduced a new regi registrar program and legacy domains, so the old domains which are not migrated yet. They just show up as expiring on the 1st of January. Next point, a domain is listed as expiring on the 1st of January. Can I register it? No, of course not. Only return answer of not registered will mean the domain is free for registration. So there was no real information. 
I emailed those guys and they simply did not reply. So I did not know when the domain would expire, when it would drop. So what I did, every morning I checked the domains, nothing automated yet. But then on July 2, well, I did my manual check like every day. It was available, I registered it, and I got it. So this was easy, this was luck, because there are a lot of parties interested in uh, such domains. But yeah, sometimes you have to get lucky too. And a few months later, in November, 28 domains were expiring on the same day. So this was like a huge day. If you imagine you could sell each of those for a few thousand, it would have been nice. So the DL domains, they cost around 40, 50 euros per year. So it would be a good time to, well, do it properly this time. At least I now knew the expiry date and drop date, but the time window was unknown. Now I had my registrar, I had my so the account filled. I used a simple automated registration API. This is another registrar. You will find the reason shortly. And they have like endpoints for domain availability, which is really easy to use just to give you an idea how little code it is. And also for registration. Now drop date comes. I have my script running since last evening, since I don't know when exactly those will drop. But around 8 o'clock, I got the first one, the next one, another one, another one, another one. I was really happy. I was already spending all the money. And then my registrar ran out of money. So my registrar also has to pay for the domains. So they had a prepaid account at the registry. And after five domains, money was out. Yeah, bad luck. Anyway, so this is also the reason why I would not name this uh, company. By the way, this company had a choice. It could have used the post-pay method, but they rather paid in advance. All right, Kyrgyzstan, some little country here in the east. There I knew the uh, drop date and expiry date based on the public information, so they were really kind. They say, hey, it's on hold before that day, then it will become available. Fine for me. Uh, also the time uh, you see at the top, but the registrars have been rather expensive. Fortunately, you could simply use their website directly. It looked like this at that time, so you have this uh, add new domain button, so you would fill out a form, click submit, you would have the domain. So but what happens when you click a button on a website? Unfortunately, I don't have the old uh, website anymore. They changed it a few months ago. But to give you an idea, let's take a look at TNG's website. And let's say I want to search for the Big Tech Day. I fill out this line. I click on Finden. And when I now open my developer tools in the browser, I see, oh, like internally, there have been this get request. And what I can do, I can copy this information and then simply rerun this request on my own. And that's what I did with those. So drop date comes. I have a best script, which is this. I will show the line. So it's a simple endpoint called create domain. You have to pass some data, like the domain name, which is R. Password are removed. You can try if you want. Then you have to input like your personal data, like account IDs, names, servers. And this I did repeatedly all the time as long as this domain is busy, the answer was uh, re returned. But yeah, at some point, uh, I was trying this 15 times per second, uh, just to be sure. At some point, after all those domain is busy, domain is busy, domain is busy, then you got, oh, domain uh, r.kg was successfully created. Good for me. Nowadays, they changed the rules, so it's now minimum two characters. Next example. <laughs> .vu, Vanuatu is this island group at the other end of the world. This is how it looks, uh, it's quite sunny, it's quite relaxed. And there were two domains expiring on the same day, which is always nice if you have multiple on the same day. And I also knew the expiry date and drop date, and even the time window, because I had another .vu domain uh, registered a few months earlier. Now, unfortunately, they have no API. So when you go to, or when you went to a registrar at that time, they would say, oh, if you want a VU domain, well, it will take us five days. 
And what they did, they simply visited the manual website of the VU domains and also filled out everything by hand. So no automation everywhere. This is how the website looks like. As, yeah, it still looks like this way. <laughs> and then on the drop date, first issue I have, of course, other end of the world, I want to visit a website I have to deal with latency. So what can I do against this problem? Exactly, I get the server in Australia was the answer. No, luckily there was uh, AWS already existing, so I got an EC2 instance in Sydney, which uh, turned my uh, latency by around 90% down, which is important when you have a multi-step website. So it's just, you, you can't just uh, repeatedly do the uh, same um, API call. You have to fill out a form, click a button, fill out something else, click a button, and so on. So what I also needed was automation. I don't want to use it by hand. At that time, there was tools like Slimer.js, Scriptable Browser, and Casper.js, like tools. Nowadays, uh, you know it maybe from uh, integration tests with Cypress, with Playwright, and so on, or also Selenium. So nowadays, it's uh, even easier to automate your own browser. I did this. I will only show you one coding sample here, which is this one. So what it's doing, it's clicking on this drop down. It enters the value one. It triggers a change because I want to register the domain for one year. And then the script is doing it for me. And it clicks through the whole website, enters all the data, account information, and so on. At that point, the domain was basically mine. I just had to manually log in to my Sydney machine click on the Buy button, enter my credit card details because I did not want uh, Amazon to have my credit card information. But yeah, this was quite nice. Yeah, I also like the right here. You can also pay by cash or check uh, locally if you want. But yeah, so I prefer the credit card. They don't allow credit card anymore because whatever, <laughs> I don't know. So what are my alternatives? I could have a direct uh, connection to a registry. I can become my own registrar in that sense, or I could rent a connection, or use one of those many drop catch or backorder service, but they don't exist for uh, every top-level domain. They're expensive and sometimes auctions. All right, so what now? What do I do with the domain? Well, I can use it for a website or redirect. I can use a URL shortener like Google, Twitter, and so on. Emails is also always nice if you have a short email address. You can sell those. Sometimes when you have domains, people will come to you and ask you, hey, can I buy this domain? No. <laughs> of course not. But what, what those guys then reply, hey, want to buy some of mine? <laughs> it's, it's a crazy world. Like you, you have people who will tell you stories, oh, I need this domain for my family website, and I just have don't have that much money, and here are some fake screenshots of domain name prices. See, it's only worth like $100. Please give it to me. No. But next point, don't lose your domain. Always renew it. I lost one of the VU domains. You can ask me about this later. <laughs> you have to always respect the foreign law. Like I mentioned, uh, LE is a Libyan domain, and some website was seized because it was in violation of Sharia law. So this can happen, be careful. There's also the issue of war in the Near East. For example, Letterly uh, lost their domain for some time, or Artsy in Syria. So be careful if you when you choose your top-level domain. Trademarks, I mentioned BMW, yeah. So there was this guy from Japan who got a lot of MW domains. And he said, well, I offer them for 1,000 or something, but BMW I offer for 1 million. And then BMW was like, hmm, this doesn't really sound like a legit business. Let's uh, call this arbitration board. And they decided, OK, this Japanese guy registered the domain in bad faith, as it's called. And so BMW got their domain for free. Now, if you want to, use, uh, if you want to register u.ps, it's available. Go ahead. Similar use cases, uh, there are social media handles and goods with limited supplies like PlayStations, concert tickets. And always be careful when you connect an API to your credit card. I know. 
But actually, what I told you the whole time is not the whole truth, because top-level domains are also just domains and can have DNS records. So what does this mean? You can have a website, like AI has, on your top-level domain. And similarly, you can also have your email addresses there, but good luck sending an email to one of those guys. And also, as a software developer, be careful when you make any assumptions about domains, about email addresses. Be careful. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>